It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back to American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. The transition from one president to the next in most election years is not a particularly gripping drama for the American people. New presidents such as Donald Trump must staff the White House, fill out a cabinet, and eventually name about 4,000 appointees throughout the federal government. In most years, few citizens ever even absorb many names of the most influential voices around the president. But this year, like the often astonishing campaign season that preceded it, Americans are watching President-elect Trump and his transition like an NFL team getting ready for its first ever Super Bowl, a very unconventional Super Bowl at that. Already the new president has signaled that he is trying to make peace, at least to some degree, with traditional Republicans and people who didn't vote for him. But he's also making clear that the Trump administration will include some of the most controversial members of his campaign team and won't be abandoning some of the issues that many found so divisive over the past year. Our guest in this episode is an extraordinary student of these crucial moments in American history. Thomas Sugru is an historian and a professor of social and cultural analysis at New York University, where he specializes in 20th century American politics, urban history, civil rights, and race. He's a frequent commentator in the mainstream media, whether that's good or bad, and has contributed often to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, The Nation, Salon, and many other publications. Professor Sugru is also the author of several books, most recently, Not Even Past, Barack Obama and the Burden of Race. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Doug. It's great to be here. So we've just had this election that ended in a very different way than many people were expecting, but also in a way that, that many Americans hoped for, uh, yes, it turns out, and even more Americans hoped not for, but nonetheless. Uh, we've just come to the end of, uh, of this remarkable election year. Let's start getting a sense from you of what the election of Donald Trump means uh, in terms of how we will now remember the presidency of Barack Obama. And I'll, I'll, I just, in your book, Not Even Past, you talked about this as a truly uh, uh, milestone event in American political history, uh, but also warned that while it looked like the arrival of a post-racial era, that there remained deep, deep divisions around race in America. But, but what's, your, what's your sense? What does this do to our memory of Barack Obama? Well, I think it's too early to know exactly how a Trump presidency will change our appraisal of an Obama administration. It's tempting uh, to um, project back uh, uh, an apocal change onto Obama's uh, administration and to suggest that Trump is going to unravel it, undo it, uh, make something entirely different in Washington. And what we know from lots of political scientists and political historians is the ship of state is hard to turn. Obama positioned himself as a transformative president, as someone who would really undo uh, uh, years of polarization with bipartisanship, would uh, transform the culture of Washington by bringing in experts and, uh, who were detached from the messiness and nitty gritty of everyday politics, who would heal America's racial and political and religious and cultural divisions. Yet making those changes proved to be a lot more difficult for Obama. Likewise, uh, Trump is promising to undo much of the Obama administration's legacy, uh, to uh, address problems that have remained unaddressed uh, economically. Uh, he's, he's promised to challenge America's immigration policy. But making changes, given the nature of Congress, the nature of um, the bureaucracy, the limitations that the president has in fundamental ways in the White House, the legacy of his predecessors, means that it's unclear how quickly and how dramatically Trump will be able to accomplish the changes that he promised on the campaign trail. Yeah, it's, it strikes me as um, uh, really notable that uh, in some of Trump's first remarks after the election, 
when he first began to talk about some of the policies and, and more specifically what they might mean, uh, when, I, when he first came out and publicly said, for instance, about the Affordable Care Act, that, oh, well, actually, maybe there's some elements of it that should remain, the, the most popular parts. Uh, and I was taken back to President Obama saying, uh, unwittingly, not, not quite realizing the cudgel that he was handing to his opponents over the next seven years, uh, when he said, you'll get to keep your doctor. And he meant one thing by that, but, but the mismatch between that one phrase, he meant one thing, but then the experience as it turned out for others. Uh, and I, I immediately wondered whether President Trump uh, is already inadvertently offering up the things that will be used to pound him for, uh, for not quite doing what so many of his supporters thought he was gonna do during the campaign. But have you, I mean, I guess that's a, that's a risk of every new president. Every new president comes in having made a boatload of campaign promises, some carefully recent and carefully thought out, others off the cuff on the campaign trail. And the electorate often takes the off the cuff uh, policy ideas just as seriously as the ones that were well developed. With Obama, you had someone who was arguably the most disciplined presidential candidate and president uh, in modern American history. Someone who seldom went off script, who was very focused uh, in, in what he said, and as a result was, I think, somewhat predictable in the direction that his policies took. Um, with Donald Trump, on the other hand, you have someone who um, had not spent a lot of time thinking out policy proposals, who spoke from the gut rather, rather than from the head, who um, could not be, by even the most capacious definition of discipline, to be called a, a disciplined candidate, and who sometimes changed positions within the same speech. Um, so the difference, I think, between Obama and Trump is that we don't know exactly what to expect out of Trump, which is why he could criticize the Affordable Care Act and then suggest that maybe part of it will survive, or he could criticize um, immigration enforcement and call for the construction of the wall and say, well, maybe it's not going to be a full wall. Maybe it'll just be a fence in some places, right? So we don't know exactly where he's going to land. But what his supporters heard and what they're going to hold him to uh, will, I think, um, pose some really interesting challenges for, for President Trump in his, uh, his first few, year, few years in office. Um, let's go back for a second to this question of, uh, of what all this means for the Obama legacy. And I think you're right that, uh, as is always the case, we won't know for a long time really how history remembers uh, Barack Obama. Uh, certainly, in the long sweep of history, the one thing will never change, and that is as being elected as the first African American president. He will be his election will be a red letter date uh, in the history books for you know, forever, really. That that's an absolute certainty. But in terms of the the more the closer uh, the closer in time examination of him, it's interesting to me that in some respects, I would say, Trump's election validates the president's caution about being too radical or pushing too hard on an agenda that might have been seen as specifically aimed at minorities or African Americans in particular. He got a lot of criticism uh, as the administration, particularly in the last years of the administration, a lot of African Americans were very critical of him not seeming to have avoided being perceived as a black president. Uh, but what happened in this election would seem to suggest that had he pushed harder in those ways, uh, he might have run into much, even greater resistance than what he did. But what do you make of that reasoning? Um, I think that reasoning is right on the mark. Obama uh, ran for the presidency um, using the rhetoric of reconciliation uh, around racial issues and bipartisanship. That meant on the campaign trail, he scarcely mentioned questions of race or of civil rights. When he did, it was primarily to African-American audiences. Um, and in his first term in office, the, the political scientist Daniel Gillian at the University of Pennsylvania showed that Obama talked less about race than any of his predecessors before, uh, up, up and including uh, or beyond John F. Kennedy. Um, so really quite extraordinary, actually, the first African-American president was the most silent in, mm -hmm. in nearly 50 years on, on questions of race. But that's because 
A mere mention of race by Obama, even the least controversial statements, often led to weeks of headlines. For example, when Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates was arrested on his front porch trying to get into his house. Uh, and Obama used that as a moment offhandedly to reflect on the history of police community tensions uh, around African Americans. And that was in the news for a couple of weeks. He was accused of fomenting racial division, of, um, of, of, of hating white people at one point by one of his critics. Um, and so Obama you know, learned and knew that by discussing racial issues in a really public way, um, he risked um, challenges to the leg legitimacy of his presidency. But more than that, on the other side, um, many of Obama's critics assumed that because he was African American, he was going to be more radical. He was going to be an outsider. He was somehow tainted by foreign ideologies. He was maybe not born in the United States, maybe a Muslim, maybe a socialist. And while Obama himself continually discounted um, the effect of those kinds of uh, conspiracy theories about his background on himself, it's clear that a lot of the opposition um, to Obama um, drew from that kind of poisonous well of thinking that he was a, a dangerous racial outsider. Um, and you know, Donald Trump making birtherism one of his kind of entry points into the national political stage played uh, to that really um, vile, steamy under, underside to American politics. But look, I mean, there's also um, legitimate ideological and political differences that were, um, you know, came out in critiques of Obama as well. Um, I, the right was just as vocal and um, sometimes just as conspiratorial when it came to the Clinton administration mm -hmm. in the 1990s, right? I mean, the number of wild conspiracy theories that swirled around the Clintons were every bit as egregious, uh, unwarranted, and oftentimes strange uh, as the conspiracy theories that whirled around Obama. So some of it definitely had to do with Obama's racial identity, but there's more at work. Uh, and, and in part, I think we also have to um, not simply write off every criticism of Obama's policy as, as based in uh, racial critique. There were legitimate differences about the size and scope of government activity, about taxation, about regulation, uh, about uh, social welfare, uh, and about economic stimulus that, that can't be boiled down to, to racial animosity toward Obama that really speak to very deep divisions about the role of government in the economy and in society that have divided Republicans and Democrats left and right for you know, going on 50 years now. And one could imagine that it's that conceivably, if we, if we look, best case scenario kind of thinking, uh, that if a Donald Trump, or let's just say it this way, a Donald Trump might be uh, the, exactly the kind of figure, if he chose to be, uh, who could help find a new sort of dialogue around some of these issues, a new way of talking about uh, some of these issues th that have vexed the country for so long, where we've made this tremendous progress in terms of race in so, so many ways, but we still are obviously incredibly vulnerable uh, around these issues, and a part of the, the base dissatisfaction of so many of the voters who supported Donald Trump, I, I think among poorer whites and the people that I know well, the people I come from out of the rural South, um, is a sense that people look down on them, the economy's left them behind, uh, that liberals and people in the cities are so quick to condemn them. Uh, and, and if it were to turn out that Donald Trump was someone who could help demonstrate some way of showing that, well, you know, that the mainstream of American life actually values those folks, uh, I mean, may, maybe there's a chance of some evolution of, of national language about how we talk about these things that could, they could take some of the accelerant away from, uh, from those conversations. I don't know, is that, is that pie in the sky, hope? I think it's a pretty optimistic assumption given that um, one of the main appeals for Trump on the campaign trail was offering a kind of a, a, a narrow definition of what it means to be an American, 
right? Um, a, a political, Obama's political rhetoric and the political rhetoric of George W. Bush when he ran as a compassionate conservative for office in 2000, um, a bipartisan rhetoric at least was, America is a diverse country with people from different backgrounds, a nation of immigrants, a nation that uh, pulls together people of different backgrounds into a, a, a cohesive whole that treasures its, its, its many voices and, and different perspectives. And we didn't get a lot of that on the campaign trail uh, from, from candidate Trump. Uh, and so I think it's going to be hard, in part because non-white segments in the electorate, um, for a very good reason, uh, are deeply suspicious of, of, of someone who, who criticizes them. The, the, the question about working class whites, disaffected working class whites, are those who have been um, suffering um, economic dislocation and have been mostly ignored. That's a really big issue and maybe one of the most interesting issues to come out of the 2016 campaign, not just from Trump, but also during the Democratic primaries from Bernie Sanders and even from Hillary Clinton, who refashioned some of the Democratic uh, platform and, and, and her own rhetoric to, to focus on those questions of dislocation. The real big problem that the United States has faced that neither party has addressed uh, adequately for the last 40 or 50 years is rising economic inequality. Um, and the real insecurity, the gnawing insecurity of folks in the lower end of the economic ladder. This year, it was white men uh, whose plight of uh, having poorly paying, insecure jobs, of having to work two jobs to take care of their families, and not being able to make ends meet, not being able to afford their mortgages, that moved to the center of the political stage. But for, uh, for Latinos and for African Americans, um, they were, in many respects, the, the canary in the coal mine. They have been dealing with these questions of economic inequality and displacement um, for decades now. Uh, and so I, I think for an adequate answer to this question of inequality and, and economic trouble is to think about ways of pulling together a policy that will address working class people regardless of the background, whether they come from small towns in the South or old industrial cities in the Midwest, like where I grew up, uh, whether they're Latinos or, or whites or African Americans. Um, and thus far, I, I don't think either party has particularly adequately responded to those serious economic dislocations. We have a ways to go there. So um, this is looking far ahead, but, the, but if we go to four years from now, if we try to, if we try to imagine what Democrats should be building toward or are likely to be building toward. More specifically, what do you imagine Democrats are going to be trying to do over the next four years to prepare for what will be their effort to, to get everything back on a different, on a different road? I think uh, as with any transitional moment in party politics, there's going to be a lot of soul searching. There's going to be intense debate and there are going to be struggles over who is going to set the new agenda. Um, the Clinton wing of the party isn't going away anytime soon. Uh, that is folks who came up in the 1990s who were part of that reimagination of the Democratic Party, making it more conservative on economic issues, uh, more liberal on social issues. But you also have um, the supporters of Elizabeth Warren uh, and Bernie Sanders who are calling for uh, a more powerful regulatory state, calling for e economic redistribution. And you've got a very large and increasingly multicultural and diverse Democratic Party. Um, representing folks who are just coming into the electorate in significant numbers. I mean, Latinos in particular, um, they've already changed the composition of the electorate in states like Nevada and Colorado, but also Arizona and Texas. Um, and uh, as, as that generation of voters gets more numerous, um, they're going to push for a reorientation of Democratic Party politics in their direction as well. So I think we're in for a really interesting ride with uh, an unpredictable uh, destination for the Democratic Party in the next two, four, six years. Mm, fascinating. You're giving a speech this afternoon here at the Miller Center. Uh, what are you going to talk about? Uh, I'm going to look at the ways in which um, Obama uh, and the Obama administration was and wasn't uh, a transformative moment in American politics. Or let me put it differently. I, I'm, I'm asking the question, was Barack Obama a transformational president? And I am going to explore the ways that 
Um, Obama was shaped and constrained by the policies of his predecessors and has more in common um, with Bill Clinton than many of his fervent supporters hoped, but also more in common with George W. Bush uh, than many political pundits and, and uh, observers would, would, would like to believe, um, both Obama supporters and Obama critics. And do you mean on that, are you talking primarily about uh, his continuation of uh, so many of the national security and foreign policy initiatives uh, and like using even more drones and, you know, and the, uh, those things which he to some degree campaigned against, and certainly campaigned on dissatisfaction about, uh, are, but in, are there other dimensions that, that you see him as an extension of, of the Bush years? Yeah, I mean, in foreign policy, Obama um, carried on and expanded the anti-terrorism policy of Clinton and Bush. There's a great deal of continuity there, much more than anyone would have expected. Guantanamo remains open, uh, and that was one of the central um, pledges he made on the campaign trail to close it and close it quickly. And um, signed a memo about it on day one right. of, of his administration. Really amazing. Right. But also on um, some domestic policy issues, there's more bipartisan agreement than one might expect even in this moment of political polarization. For example, um, public education. Both the Bush administration and the Obama administration put an emphasis on innovation, on competition, on bringing market values into, uh, into education. Both uh, George W. Bush and Barack Obama were strong supporters of charter schools. Uh, and, and the differences between the parties around that issue were not nearly as great um, as, as one would have expected. Obama was the first urban president in decades, uh, maybe in a century, um, and pledged early on in his administration, one of his first executive orders was creating a White House Office of Urban Affairs. But on urban policy, um, most of what he offered was a continuation of the um, enterprise zone and then renamed empowerment zone policies that uh, came from the Bush and Clinton administrations. He, he didn't depart significantly from the, the politics of his predecessors. So there are ways in which when we take a look at a, a president, even one who promises to be transformational, we have to understand uh, that that administration is shaped by and directed by the legacies of policies that are already in place in, under, his, under, under his predecessors. It's, it's really hard to turn, turn the ship of state. So let's, uh, let's imagine that it's a few days uh, after the inauguration, sometime in early February, and your phone rings and you pick it up and someone says, President Trump would like you to come to the White House and spend 10 minutes uh, giving your best advice uh, for, in particular, uh, as an observer of all the things you've talked about, in particular, he wants to hear from you and others like you about the best way for him to actually uh, get his hands around the rift in the country and push some semblance of the majority of Americans back together. But if you went to the White House, given that opportunity, what's the advice you'd give President Trump on how to heal the nation? I would say you have to roll back some of your um, harshest rhetoric around immigrants, around religious minorities, uh, uh, and, and you have to do that now. You should have done it yesterday. Um, I would say, secondly, um, the, the parts of the government that are responsible for dealing with those kinds of issues, particularly the Department of Justice, needs to be in the hands of folks who are still deeply committed to ferreting out discrimination, um, dealing with inequalities that persist by race uh, and by ethnicity in American society. Those aren't going to go away with the wave of a wand, and they're not going to go away even with the most lofty rhetoric. It requires people in place in institutions like the Department of Justice uh, to address those problems. I would say um, perhaps most fundamentally, um, it's important to come up with policies that deal with inequalities by class, by of economic insecurity that affect all Americans, regardless of their um, region, regardless of their race, regardless of their ethnicity. One of the most significant issues that any president would have to deal with is the persistence of insecure employment, of relatively low wages, of working conditions that uh, have been degrading um, for, for many Americans. Uh, and, and those improvements in those arenas will benefit everyone. Um, and I would say um, 
Mr. Trump, I'm skeptical that you'll do any of these things, but listen, uh, adapt, and perhaps uh, we'll see movement in a positive direction. Well, let's hope that uh, let's hope that President Trump does some version of those things. Let's hope that the best case scenario is the one that we get. Well, thank you for being here, Tom Segru. Great, thank you. If you'd like to send us a comment about this episode or join in our ongoing conversation about the big issues in American life, go to the Miller Center Facebook page or follow us on Twitter. My handle is at Douglas Blackman. Our guest is at Tom Segru. For a transcript of this dialogue or to watch other episodes, visit us at millercenter.org American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. See you again next week.